Arim Jaffa. Budgets are seen by most lay people, mostly from the lens of what's in it for me. What am I going to have to pay more for? What goodies am I going to get? How will my business benefit? Economists and market watchers look to be convinced of whether the budget will make Singapore more competitive and foster GDP growth. But just as organizations are finding that employees are increasingly looking beyond dollars and cents for companies with a clear and inspiring purpose, I believe that Singaporeans are also looking for more in the budget. Do the values reflect and, and do the values reflected by the policies and initiatives proposed align with our own core, va core values? Because when the values espoused align with your own core values, it is a very special and awesome feeling. Just ask any Liverpool fan who has bought into the ethos that you'll never walk alone. It's about not just getting results, but doing it in a way that makes you deeply proud to be a Singaporean. On this measure, the evolution of the social compact towards a fairer, greener and more inclusive Singapore, as described by the Finance Minister, delivers. These are values and a vision for the future that are shared by the broad middle ground of Singaporeans. Personal responsibility and collective support. The yin and yang of the Singapore way. Mutually reinforcing. While reinforcing personal responsibility through tying incentives and support to work, the budget continues to tilt towards collective support. This has been happening for the past more than 10 years. The government has recognized the need for greater social support in response to growing inequality, technological change, and changing societal expectations, and adjusted the system very deliberately over time, including the introduction of new anchors of a social security system like welfare, workfare, civil support, and now PWM, and the tightening of foreign manpower policy. Collective support means we all pay, which also ensures that we all understand that nothing we get comes for free. But the wealthy pay more. The more money you have, the better life you lead, the more you can afford to pay for other people's children's education and other people's health care. That is just and fair. I welcome the progressive moves in the budget. The uplifts in salaries for lower income workers, higher income taxes for the rich, well taxes, and a combination of, GDP, of GST with GST vouchers and other rebates by raising revenue in a broad-based way, but spending it in a targeted and fair way, we set ourselves up for a more sustainable fiscal position while giving time and support for the transition. However, one area I urge the Ministry to review in light of recent developments is the household support package. Many MPs on both sides of the House have spoken about their concerns over the cost of living. I must echo this concern for low- and middle-income households. I sat and talked to one of my residents. He and his wife has five children. They live in a five-room flat, a very typical upper-middle-income family. Over the past few months, his electricity bill has gone up from $120 a month to $200 or $80 a month, multiplied up by $12, $960 a year. His water bill has gone up from $30 to $60, multiplied by $12, $360. His patrol bill, which he uses to work and ferry his kids to, to and from school, has gone from $500 to $800 a $300 increase a month, $3,600 a year. His food expenditure, they don't cook a lot, so they mostly eat out, has gone up by about 15 to 20%, he says. Fortunately, his spend on healthcare and education have not gone up by much. But as you can see, these add up pretty quickly. And some of these we expect to come down in due time, and MTI has previously shared, but the developments in Ukraine and the continued disruption of supply chains give rise to concern that this situation might not go, past, might go on past the end of the year. Mr. Speaker, if anything is regressive, inflation is regressive. So I'd like to ask the Finance Minister what assumptions on inflationary trends were made in developing the 560 million household support package and whether more support can be given, including to the middle income for whom Comcare is not an option. But long term, the way to make sure that the increased cost of living does not bite too hard is to ensure that incomes grow faster than expenses at every level of the workforce. With the expanded PWM, I think we're quite well covered with the lower income workers. For the rest, for the middle income, it is vital that we continue to enhance the competitiveness of our economy so that we can continue to create and retain good jobs. It is vital 
that we continue to invest in capability building and take a balanced, tempered approach in implementing the tax and manpower policy changes. In the Committee of Supply, I will speak more on measures to enhance the competitiveness of the economy, build capabilities in our people and businesses, accelerate the green transition, and manage the healthcare costs and workforce for an aging population. I would like to focus the rest of my speech today on three strategies for our nation's development. Strategies that, align, that are driven by alignment of values. The first is an economic strategy. Go after the beyond great companies. There is a set of leading global companies that are moving past all definitions of great, companies that use to focus on scale and strong shareholder returns. One example is Microsoft. These beyond great companies have re realized that sustainable competitive advantage in an era of technological, geopolitical, and social change can only be attained by being responsive to the needs of all stakeholders, shareholders, but also customers, employees, local communities, governments, and the natural environment. They have agile business models that offer customized solutions to borderless communities of digitally connected customers and are experts at forming flexible ecosystems of partners. Conscious of their responsibility to the countries they operate, they nurture local expertise, enable SMEs to participate in global and regional value chains, and help the countries they are in to develop customized solutions to their toughest problems. They're willing to provide jobs and opportunities for a combination of skills, from the highly skilled global professionals who compete with the best in the world, to the middle and lower skilled workers who may compete more uh, often around, often with lower cost resources in the region, because they understand that for Singapore to be true to our values, we must have jobs for every Singaporean. The government led by EDB can proactively attract and nurture beyond great companies to anchor in Singapore. To attract these companies, we must continue to offer financial stability, predictability, transparency, low taxes. But these are stable stakes. Beyond great companies will also demand world-class digital infrastructure and customs procedures that minimize transaction costs, cross-border data sharing frameworks and safeguards, regional trade agreements that harmonize regulations. All of these are necessary to, for them to transact international business through digital platforms and fast-evolving ecosystems. Beyond great companies also require flexible labor policies and the ability to tap on global employees and freelancers sitting outside the host country. And within country, a workforce that is not only highly skilled with specialized technical capabilities, but also people with a digital mindset who are agile and always hungry to learn, who have motivation and grit. In my maiden speech at the start of this parliament, I spoke about the need for governments and companies to invest in our people. We have made significant moves since then, but still not enough. We must continue to accelerate the reskilling and upskilling of our workforce for a more digital, more green future. And over the long term, we must re-examine the entire education system from early childhood all the way to work to enable learning at the right time, at the right place, on a personalized learning journey. And we must also collaborate in public-private ecosystems with these beyond great companies to align plans, policies, and incentives to achieve mutually shared goals beyond profit and growth. Second, the strategy deals with social policy. Implement a permanent growth dividend. As I alluded to earlier in my speech, we have built over time a comprehensive social security system fit for our demographic profile with workfare, silver support, PWM. Really quite game changing. I must confess though, when schemes like the solidarity payment and CDC vouchers were announced, I was quite bemused. Did rich Singaporeans really need $100 to feel solidarity with other Singaporeans? But after getting feedback on the vouchers from the ground, I must say my position has shifted. My residents have told me that it felt good. My residents in five room, EA, EM, and jumbo flats, we happen to have a lot in my division. They told me it felt good to finally get something when usually there's nothing for them. Even though most of them, quite a few of them donated theirs. In the discussion on GST in this and previous budgets, we have talked about the advantages of GST as a broad-based tax or revenue. Perhaps there's something to be said about boosting solidarity through a broad-based distribution which also provides an additional way to enhance financial security and mitigate inequality for those whose fortunes do not reflect the nation's success. The transition, the, the support package has elements of this, uh, but if we want to be more inclusive, could we explore a more structural change to provide a permanent growth dividend tied to GDP or budget surpluses with different payouts, of course, based on wealth or income, partly in cash, partly in CPF, that gives every Singaporean an additional stake in the nation's economic progress reinforcing that we win and lose as a team. 
We've done this before with one-off payments, like the SG bonus in 2018, growth dividend 20, 2011, new Singapore shares in 2001, and of course the discounted Singtel shares in the 90s. It may feel moot to even be discussing this in the context of consecutive years of budget deficits, but I hope the minister might consider this as we move forward. The third strategy deals with shaping our values themselves. Build a positive national culture. Our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, famously said in 1977, you know the Singaporean, he is hardworking, industrious, rugged individual, or we would not have made the grade. But let us also recognize that he is a champion grumbler. 45 years later, we may laugh and rightly say, some things never change. But who do we really want to be? Have we thought about how much better and stronger we would be if we were more positive people? Not just law-abiding, but positive. There are three components of a, posit of a positive national culture that I think are particularly important. First is empathy. In dealing with people, we must make the effort to get to know them as whole human beings. It increases the likelihood that they'll go the extra mile when we need them to. The relationship, the trust between the people and the government and the public service is a massive ingredient to sustainable success for our nation. Second is mutual respect. If we respect others, we must accept that people have different strengths and weaknesses and support them to use their strengths to flourish and not be stuck with narrow ideas of what good looks like or what should be valued. We must accept different backgrounds, cultures and viewpoints while not letting society become more and more fragmented. We must speak to one another on the streets and in this house with respect and with integrity. Third, aspiration or ambition, always believing that we can do better, be better. We fight complacency and cynicism by surrounding ourselves with people who push us to aim higher and do better. We believe that no matter how small we are, our actions matter. For example, with respect to climate change, we could take the view that Singapore going to net zero may not move the needle if bigger countries in the region and the world do not do their part. Or we could take the view that I mooted in last year's budget debate that by investing in R&D and developing solutions for the greatest existential crisis of our times, we can lead and change the world. We must cultivate that eternal optimism, that sense of idealism and adventure. And Mr. Speaker, at this point, I can't help but remember another famous speech by our founding, founding Prime Minister. There's a glorious rainbow that beckons those with a spirit of adventure. And there are rich findings at the end of that rainbow. To the young and not so old, I say, look at that horizon, follow that rainbow, go ride it. Not all will be rich. Quite we few, we find a vein of gold. Dig it out, but all those who pursue that rainbow will have a joyous and exhilarating ride and some profit. Mr. Speaker, building this positive natural, national culture receives, requires a lot of work that has to start early in life, in our schools, in our communities, our workplaces, in our interactions with government agencies, in social media, in the metaverse. We have to enable and stimulate the buildings of network support groups, mentorship programs, volunteer groups, and in my youth, we had a lot of public education campaigns on radio and TV. Who can forget Singer, the Courtesy Lion, Timmy the Bee, all those jingles. Now, the same types of campaigns may not be quite so effective for Singaporeans today, but we have even more new mediums and tools and talents today to put out relatable and inspiring content to propagate positivity among Singaporeans. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, there was a catchphrase that became quite popular. Test negative, be positive. Let us infect one another with positivity, regardless of backgrounds, cultures, or, posit or political leanings. Mr. Speaker, before I end, let me say a few words in Malay. Berapa minggu dahulu saya menerima mesej melalui Facebook daripada seorang penduduk Woodlands yang berbangsa Cina. Beliau bermula dengan menjelaskan bahawa niatnya bukanlah untuk meningkatkan isu perkawaman, malah untuk memberi dorongan kepada saya, ahli Parlimen Melayu di DRC Sembawang. Beliau berkongsi apa yang dia terdengar dari sekumpulan wanita berbangsa Cina. Ayo, orang Melayu secara umumnya kurang lajin. Tetapi yang dah nampak ahli parlimen Melayu JRC Sembawang ini, kami kelihatan begitu ceria, begitu rajin dan aktif. Adakah ini suatu isu perkawaman? Ada yang akan mengatakan ya, ada yang akan mengatakan tidak. Tetapi ia sekurang-kurangnya prasangka. Hakikatnya sebagai kaum minoriti, kita sering perlu bekerja lebih keras daripada orang lain hanya untuk dianggap setaraf dengan kaum majoriti. Adakah itu adil? Tidak. 
Tetapi adakah terdapat keinginan yang tulus untuk bekerjasama untuk mengubah keadaan ini? Saya percaya ini berlaku dengan pemerintah kami ini. Hari ini memang ada orang yang suka melemparkan kritikan mengenai ketidakadilan terutama sekali di laman sosial media. Mereka mengamalkan budaya cancel atau cancel culture. Malangnya, ini kadang-kadang boleh menyetuskan ketidakadilan yang besar terhadap kerja keras yang dilakukan untuk mengubah keadaan. Belanjawan 2022 membayangkan visi Singapura yang lebih adil, hijau dan lebih inklusif. Singapura yang lebih adil dan inklusif di mana hasil kemajuan dikongsi dengan lebih sama rata oleh semua penduduk memberi ramalan yang baik untuk masyarakat kita. Saya berharap masyarakat kita akan memanfaatkan sepenuhnya komitmen untuk melabur dan dalam segi rakyat kita dan juga anak-anak kita. Saya berharap lebih banyak akan dilakukan untuk membina budaya kebangsaan yang positif dan melalui membentukkan jaringan pembimbingan dan komuniti, masyarakat Melayu dapat mengumumkan semangat yang positif. Saya pasti ramai yang tidak berpuas hati tentang kenaikan GST yang akan dimulakan pada tahun hadapan. Tetapi saya juga yakin bahawa dengan package assurance 6.6 billion, 6.6 billion, sebagian besar masyarakat kita tidak akan terjejas oleh kenaikan GST sama, sama sekali sehingga 5 atau 10 tahun atau lebih dari sekarang. Sebaliknya, ada yang akan mendapat bonus GST. Dalam jangka masa ini, kita mesti terus berusaha meningkatkan pendapatan di semua lapisan masyarakat kita melalui usaha individu untuk meningkatkan kemahiran dan melalui usaha pemerintah ini selanjutnya. Namun, saya juga mengaku bahawa terdapat kebimbangan yang sah tentang kos kehidupan yang tinggi. Saya berharap pemerintah akan bergerak pentas-pantas untuk menyokong rakyat Singapura lebih-lebih lagi kos yang tidak yang, yang tinggi berterusan. Saya juga harap pemimpin 4G akan terus membina hubungan yang tulen dan berdasarkan empati dengan masyarakat kami. Dengan memahami nilai kami, kagangan kami, tetapi juga cita rasa, bakat, usaha atau, hos, atau hasil kami. Saya juga berharap pemimpin, pemimpin 4G akan menjadi sekutu kami dan membantu masyarakat Melayu mengembangkan dan menggunakan kemahiran, kelebihan dan keistimewaan kami untuk menghasilkan manfaat kepada diri sendiri dan kepada masyarakat. Kerana aspirasi masyarakat Melayu bukan setakat mahu menjadi lebih baik daripada sebelumnya. Kami mahu berganting bau dengan kaum lain di sama taraf. Mr. Speaker, um, the budget is a good and fair one. It gives me... Um, Sorry. See. Mr. Speaker, Budget 22 makes a significant move down the path of a fairer, greener, more inclusive Singapore, from which may emerge a vision of a Singapore that is beyond green. They move further to boost capabilities, to keep our economy, our people competitive, scaling up early and intensive interventions to boost social mobility. It's a budget we can be proud of. I support the budget. Thank you.